Hello there and welcome to my video on how to max out your crafting skills on the Elder Scrolls Tamriel Unlimited. Uh, today I'll be taking you through each of the trade skills, all six of them, and I'll be showing you how to organize your materials, uh, how to maximize your crafting workflow so that you're most efficiently using your materials to produce the best results you possibly can, and ultimately how to max out your crafting skills, which I'm assuming you're here to see. Also, look, what I'll do big picture too is show you how to organize your account to max all your crafting skills out as well. So how to spread the workload across uh, all your characters and how to set yourself self up ultimately so that you're getting the most out of what you're doing. Now, as you can probably gather, there is a lot of content to go through today. So as you've already seen, I've put a menu system in place. This will allow you to jump around to the content that you're most interested in looking at. And every single section that you go to will have a menu that will bounce you back to the beginning as well. So um, I hope to give you the most amount of information as I can in the most efficient way possible. As you may have learned by now, there's no limit to the amount of crafting skills that any particular character can learn. Effectively, one character could max out all six crafting skills if that's what you wanted to do. For the sake of this exercise, what we'll be doing is we will be creating three characters and we'll be splitting the workload across them. For the simple reason that A, there's an enormous amount of materials to be managed uh, for crafting characters. So this way it splits the workload across three of them. And the second one, more importantly, is there's a skill point investment required too in maxing out your characters too. So if we'd gone with one character, we'd pretty much need a max level character to do that. When we split the workload across three characters, we can move our characters up to around the level 25, level 30 range and max those skills out as well. So it's less of a time investment on each character and you'll get a better return that way. There's an equipment crafting and a consumable crafting Ritz billboard in every city in Tamriel. Uh, now, assuming that you've done the um, pre-quest for each of the particular Ritz, which is very, very easy to complete, these will let you do up to six Ritz every day. And look, you may as well. Every single Ritz that you perform will pay uh, a reasonable amount of money, a small, and across eight characters, that's going to add up really, really quickly. It's going to pay for your crafting. It's going to pay itself off. Um, also, there's a chance of getting survey maps and um, materials, even um, rare and, and legendary tempers from completing writs as well. Uh, look, if you want to do your equipment crafting writs, then head to the Fighters Guild and you'll find Milaneth, this character here. She will give you the kickoff for the three trade skill writs, which will show you all the fundamentals you need in, in crafting. Um, the, she'll give you the equipment writs. If you go to the Mages Guild, then you will find Danel Talano as well, who will give you uh, access to the writs for provisioning, enchanting, and alchemy. Now I'm making some key assumptions before we start. The first of which is that you are level one in your crafting skills. You're right at the beginning of your journey here. However, if you're not, you're still going to learn something. I'm confident of that because there's a lot of um, tips and tricks on how to maximize your workflow anyway. The second assumption is that you already understand the crafting process, uh, that you're familiar with the mechanics when it comes to crafting in, in the Elder Scrolls. And the third assumption is that you have already gathered a reasonable supply of materials, enough to kick you off comfortably and get you started in the game. If you're not au fait with um, the crafting process or material gathering, here are a couple of links. Have a look at these videos and they will get you up to speed and get you to where we are right now. All right, let's do this. Blacksmithing and Clothier skills are so similar to one another, the workflow is almost identical, so we're going to put the two together. Uh, and this is going to work in your favour later on in the game as well when you start making set items. You'll be able to travel out to the same hidden crafting station site, and from there you'll be able to make uh, the cloth, the leather, and the metal sets all from the same location. Now as far as character choices go for a blacksmith Clothier, and this rule pretty much goes for all three uh, of your crafters, you want a character class uh, and a character race that's going to be able to level quickly and independently from everybody else as well. I recommend a sorcerer or a healer. Healers in this game, in my opinion, are quite overpowered. They hit like trucks and they've got massive survivability as well. You're going to need, um, by the time you've maxed your skills out, you'll need about 19 points for blacksmithing. 
22 if you want uh, the hireling skill as well uh, and you'll need 20 points for the clothier skill as, uh, for the clothier class as well 23 if you want the hireling for that as well so you're looking at around 45 points all up that you're going to have to have in your character uh, so you want one that can adventure that can go out there and get those points bearing in mind that you can also get points from um, sky shards and doing uh, a lot of um, faction quests as well will also give you extra points too this character is level 28 uh, and i'm only two points shy of, of what i need in order to get um, everything maxed out now I keep all the materials for blacksmith and clothier in the bank uh, for a couple of reasons. The first of which is I can access them from any point across Tamriel without actually having to carry them. And you're going to be building a lot of stuff as well, so you want as much bank space, uh, uh, as, as much inventory space available to you as you can. Otherwise you're going to be running back and forth and that's going to get tiresome pretty quick. The second is it means that you can do writs on all of your characters, and why wouldn't you? Effectively, every time a character completes a writ, they will get uh, a small amount of cash, which builds up when all your characters are doing it every day. Um, and also from the reward, they, they will get a, a small collection of materials. They have a chance of getting rare and elite tempers, uh, which is going to speed the process right up for you, and is also an excellent way to make cash. And they've got a chance of getting survey maps as well, which show the location of uh, some super harvesting nodes uh, in a particular zone relevant to the level. So if uh, you're doing level 1 writs, you'll be doing... Um, you'll be um, finding maps that point to places in Stonefalls or um, Glenumbra and, and all of that. And they'll have seven nodes of that level, uh, each of which will give double the yield of a normal harvesting node, plus one node from the next level up as well, which also gives the double yield as well. So it's a worthwhile process. Power leveling is based on two factors efficiency and effectiveness. Now when we apply this to crafting or maxing out our crafting in the Elder Scrolls, what we're looking for is a perfectly struck balance between the amount of resources consumed versus the amount of experience points returned every time the operation is completed. Experience gain in crafting in the Elder Scrolls is based entirely on the level of the item that you've crafted. It's got nothing to do with other factors like the amount of resources consumed in the process or an estimated value or weight of the item. The shop value doesn't matter. It's simply the level of the item crafted. So what that means effectively is at level 1, the uh, or any level, the item that consumes the least amount of resources is the most efficient path for you. And just to break this down, uh, have a look over here. We've got an iron greatsword, level 1, using 5 iron ingots per operation, while a dagger only requires 2 iron ingots to, to build. So what that means is for every greatsword that I build, I could have built 2.5 daggers. I could have got 2.5 times the experience just by focusing on these. Crafting an iron caps out at level 14. That's the highest level item you can create when using iron as a resource, which means that the next tier unlocks at 16 and builds up to 24. If jumping from steel to orichalcum, you see orichalcum starts at 26. The increments of 6 as far as crafting goes, as far as the curve for experience return versus the amount of resources consumed, uh, it spikes, it peaks at 6 and then steadily declines off until it hits the end of its tier. So if I was to make steel daggers the most, uh, the most efficient and effective path I could use would be to make level 16 daggers. I'm going to get the maximum amount of experience while using the absolute minimum amount of materials required to craft for that tier. And while each time I level up I'll be getting more experience for um, the item that I craft, the amount of resources that I use steadily climbs and that it drags that curve down until you reach the end. A level 24 steel dagger is the least efficient item I could possibly craft for that tier. So as far as critical pathing goes, as far as um, finding the most efficient power leveling method uh, for crafting in the Elder Scrolls, the blacksmithing, clothier and for woodworking, to find the item that requires the least amount of resources to create per tier, create the lowest level item in that tier, which means you'll have the most, you'll, you'll use the least amount of resources per operation, but you'll get a respectable amount of experience points every time. Follow those two simple rules, you cannot go wrong. 
You also get uh, experience for deconstructing items as well. So effectively you could make a bunch of items, say daggers, uh, put them in your backpack, go straight to the deconstruction screen and start busting them down again. You'll get a return on your materials, plus you'll get a little experience for doing it as well. Interestingly enough in this game, you get more experience points for deconstructing uh, items that have been made by other people. Uh, it's it's quite a substantial difference from deconstructing your own and this in itself is a valid strategy in um, in actually leveling your um, any trade skill that has deconstruction as an option it also works for enchanting as well as woodworking uh, blacksmith and clothing obviously too so um, some ways that you could use this is is make a buddy in your guild, join a, a guild that has uh, high level crafters in there, and um, strike up some deal. Either either buy the materials or accumulate the materials and send them off to this other person so that they can build items for you. Uh, and then when they mail those items back, you can break them down. Now level doesn't matter. Uh, for example, you could be a tier one crafter. If somebody could send you a tier four item. You can deconstruct that item. You'll get a massive spike of experience for doing it as well however since that is out of your range as a crafter there's a there's a three tier difference you're not going to recover any material so be aware of that now intricate items are also worth their weight in gold as well you can find them in most of the um, guild stores around tamriel people selling um, intricate items that they've either looted or ones that they've gotten as rewards for completing writs as well intricate items give a much higher return on, on um, crafting experience when you deconstruct them now i've had success as well with contacting players within guilds that i've joined who've maxed out their crafting skills who still routinely do their writs every day and they and they do it for um for elite tempers uh, and also for the money obviously that you get or any recipes but many of these um Ritz will also pay them with um, uh, with intricate items as well, and since they're maxed out, the absolute highest level items that you can get from from crafting. So, uh, if that's outside your crafting range, make a deal with these people, get them to send them to you, COD if necessary, and break those down, and you will get an enormous amount of, of crafting experience for those too. About every third or fourth day, I'll take my highest level character, which has the keen eye skill uh, in blacksmithing, clothier, woodworking, and also in alchemy. And I'll hit a tier one zone. If I'm um, farming in Pact, I'll be hitting Dalmora. Uh, for Covenant, I'll go to Betnik, the island of Betnik, and Kanathi's Roost if I'm using an Aldmeri Dominion character. And I'll go through and I'll harvest for about an hour. I'll get as many T1 materials as I can, either for an hour or until I hit 200 um, metal resources. Take those back, drop them all in the bank, and then what I'll do is I will take my crafted, my highest level one that I've got, and go in there and refine those resources down. Now, for, for a couple of reasons. The first is that um, depending on the level of my... Um, where are we? Let's have a look. Clothing, my unraveling skill or blacksmithing, my metal extraction skill. Um, the higher they are, if they're maxed out, I've got a chance of getting legendary level tempers each time that I perform a um, refining operation. And those things would pay enormously. Generally, they're a minimum 3,000. But depending on how the economy is going, they sell for up to five, even 6,000 gold as well. So that's money in the bank. That's a reward for that. The second payoff for me is that all my characters, which will all my other alts, which will be around tier one in that crafting skill, as it's not a non-focal skill, are able to perform writs every day um, using those materials that are stockpiled. Now, those materials will also pay with other materials, um, and um, they'll also pay with survey maps and that sort of stuff as well. Plus, again, there's a second chance there to get. Um, materials as well and just by doing those writs on all my characters every day i'm looking at a return of a minimum of around four thousand gold just for blacksmithing and clothier which again can be um, used and plowed back into crafting by purchasing materials um, from um, guild stores all across tamriel and that will keep your main crafter in business and working and minimize the amount of time that you need to be spending in harvesting materials at a higher level done it effectively crafting will pay for itself and then some you should be able to profit on top of it as well 
and that concludes blacksmithing uh, look if you've got any other tips or tricks in there um, then by all means please post them in the, in the comment section I do read that and what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll do the best I can to incorporate them into a, an updated video down the line as well uh, look if you got anything out of just from watching this blacksmithing um, video uh, or section of the video please don't be afraid to hit the like button down the bottom there and also subscribe to my channel I promise you more We're combining alchemy and provision for our second character. Both of these char uh, crafting skills are very, very easy to level. Provisioner, uh, you can do in an hour, maybe an hour and a half if you've got everything in place. Alchemy you can take a little longer, but there tend to be more materials to accumulate. However, using some of the strategies that I've laid down for you, they're both um, very, very achievable. Now, one thing that bears mention, while they both level very, very quickly, um, perform uh, will offer similar benefits to your um, active characters and so on uh, combining these two will take an enormous amount of inventory space so you need to be spending money on increasing these up to a good level here i've got 108 inventory space uh, at the moment 100 um, from doing the upgrades another eight from the, the stable upgrade spending 250 a day to increase my storage capacity by one i haven't really been that vigilant in doing it i've only got eight points so far however most of that space is filled up what i will add though is that i have got these things here these are all for the uh the top level uh provisioning writs and i i do those every day because they give materials and they've also got a chance of giving rare um recipe fragments for the um ambrosia If you followed my advice from the blacksmithing video, then you will have been doing large harvests through T1 zones like Betnik, uh, Dalmora, or Kanathi's Roost. You'll have been going through there on a high level of character and you'll have been accumulating your alchemy materials. Once you've got those in place, and uh, you need to be doing writs. Writs are a really powerful tool for, um, for leveling. Uh, but secondly, and more importantly, they will then become your most reliable uh, source of materials for uh, maxing out your alchemy. Now, interesting point to note is uh, any character that's accepted a writ for alchemy does not actually have to make anything. As long as the um, uh, component that they use to complete the writ has been crafted, uh, then you can use it. So what I do is I take the character that I'm using as an actual alchemist and I'll make a whole bunch of T1 sips of health, magicka and stamina, and I'll drop them in the bank, about 30 of each. Um, and what I'll also do is I'll take um, the um, T1 materials that are required to complete uh, the first level writs as well, the first tier writs, and I'll also drop them all in the bank. Now, when one of your alts accepts uh, an alchemy writ, it'll tell them that they require a sip and a material. They go straight to the bank, they take one of that sip, and you'll notice that it updates automatically, and they take one of that material, they're ready to hand the writ in. Now, the benefit, obviously, for um, handing in writs is when you've done eight writs on eight different characters, you're going to get a nice little cash hit there. But the second, and more importantly, is the reward also comes in the form of a whole bunch of alchemical uh, materials as well. You're going to get between... Uh, 10 and 20 I believe it is uh, materials every time a root is completed and this is what's going to keep you all fully charged up um, and once you've done this for about uh, maybe a week maybe two weeks um, you'll have a massive stockpile of materials sitting in your bank now once they you drop those in your bank if they're not required uh, to complete a t1 writ then uh, get your alchemist in there take it withdraw them all and store them and that's going to keep space efficient for you in your bank they'll also receive um, water as part of the writ reward as well and that's going to stockpile up very very quickly for your um your alchemist this character is level 23. Now, if I go to my skills list and have a look, that's every skill filled in uh, to capacity for provisioning. So all the boxes are ticked there. And if I go to alchemy, I'm missing out on keen eye reagents, but I, I don't use this character at all to harvest. Uh, and that's medicinal skill, everything filled out as well. Snake blood, I'm missing a few points in that, but with a little care when you're mixing potions, I haven't found downsiding and the negative effects of potions to be a real a real problem for me at least not so far anyway not till i get to the higher levels i suppose 
Again, bear in mind, I've been adventuring on this character, but I've also crea uh, completed a whole bunch of quests for factions at award additional points. And I've been very vigilant in going out and getting sky shards as well, sometimes going up into much, much higher zones to find those out of the way but easy to get. Uh, sky shards are going to help me get those additional points. Now you're going to be creating a whole bunch of superfluous material, excess potions that you'll never use while you're leveling this skill out. So I strongly recommend that you get the chemistry skill which will increase the yield every time you create something to three extra potions per crafting attempt instead of just one. And when you go to provisioning, uh, also uh, chef which creates a three additional uh, quantity of food. And Brewer here, which creates three additional extra servings of any drink that you complete as well. The, the simple reason being, once you've got a... Every time you're producing, you're producing way more than you normally would. And at the end, when you've got all these materials which you can't resell to anybody, which you're not going to use, just take them to a vendor and you know you're at least getting the, the best possible return on the money that you're spending and the effort that you're putting into what you're doing. Um, I, look, honestly, I'd, I'd put these skills ahead of connoisseur or gourmand, uh, which aren't going to serve you until you're actually creating food that your characters are going to start using and again that to the equivalents in uh, alchemy as well medicinal use it won't matter how long the potion lasts if you're not going to drink it so um this way uh, you're getting the most money back for your efforts you can plow that money back into crafting again and if, a penny safe is a penny and you know the story I'm adding a link right now for the tamrailjournal.com and there's an excellent crafting and profession guide on alchemy which lists all of the properties uh, that the particular components carry. Now when you first have a reagent sitting in this, um, this menu here, all four of the properties will be blanked out. It invites you to muddle your way through and try different combinations until you actually unlock something. But when you consider the price of reagents and the amount of work required to unlock four, uh, it becomes a major pain in the ass. So what I did was I went to this guide, I had a look at the, the reagent properties that are already listed there. They are not dynamic, they do do not change so even if you're looking at dragon thorn and all four properties are, are, are blanked out it will have increased weapon power lower armor restore stamina and weapon crit as its four properties all you need to do is find another reagent that shares at least one of those properties add the two to the reagents window here add some water hit the button and what will happen is it will create the appropriate potion and it will unlock the properties on both of those reagents on a particular item you'll you'll have an achievement uh, when they're all unlocked you'll get an additional achievement as well um, but the, the best thing about it is when you can see all of the properties on each of the materials as well it makes the whole potion crafting process so much easier once you've unlocked the uh, laboratory use skill you'll also get a third reagent slot which means that you can start to create some some of the more interesting potions out there once it'll increase your spell power your spell crit and also recharge back a bit of magicka every time you drink them other ones that'll increase your weapon crit or your, your base weapon damage um, and we'll introduce a third property as well. You can make potions that simply restore health, magicka, and stamina or all in one hit. So um, make the effort to unlock all of these skills. It will make the whole leveling process for you uh, so much easier than before. Don't be afraid to spend money on buying water. Water's the big determiner on the level of the um, potion that you can make. If I scroll up the top here and take a look here, see we've got all our different water types here. It determines the level of the potion that you're going to create. The second that you can make a level 30 potion, you only want to be making level 30 potions. And that way you know you're getting the best experience return from crafting that you possibly can get. Your go-to add-on for alchemy is multi-craft. It's a fantastic add-on. And what it does is exactly what it says. I've added two reagents. Look here, I can make a potion of stamina, level 30. That's the level of the water that I've put in there. And down the bottom here, you'll see the slide bar. If I slide this up, I can make up to 28 in one operation. I'm going to drop it down to 12, 11, 10, hit craft, and then go make a cup of coffee. But I better do it quickly. I'm in a delve just west of Ebenhart at the moment on a level 47 healer. Why? Because uh, this dungeon is full of baskets and barrels and crates and so on, each one of which has got uh, some sort of component material that's required for provisioning. 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend about 30 minutes to an hour here accumulating as much as I can and this is going to basically kick off um, provisioning and will give me the momentum I need to max the skill out as quickly as possible on this character or any character for that matter now the completion rewards for provisioning are quite substantial so it's very very much in your interest to be doing them on as many characters as you can per day get all eight of your characters doing provisioning writs and you'll find for every completion that you do you'll get the gold that you're expecting you'll also get a whole big bunch of materials as well in stacks of five or ten uh, i've had up to 30 materials in a day um, plus you will also get a, a recipe for every time you complete relevant to the tier of completion so if you've been doing tier, tier one writs you're going to get tier one recipes you find you're going to um, complete the recipe requirements for all your various um, faction writs very very quickly if you do it this way now just like alchemy you do not need to complete uh, or create the item on the character that's accepted and handing in the writ as long as the item has been crafted uh, any character can take that item and it can hand it in to complete a writ this is a list of all the possible um, tier 1 provisioning writ combinations per day. Every day you take a writ, depending on your faction, uh, your writ will be one of the three combinations below uh, listed here today. So these are the recipes that you want to get at least one copy of. Give them all to your main provisioner, let them learn these recipes. And a perfectly valid tactic is to make a stack of each one of these food items and drop them in your uh, shared bank. This way, each, each day that your other uh, alts accept the provisioning route they can go straight to the bank withdraw those it'll update their um journal straight away and they can turn that red and if you're going to be concentrating all of your characters in the same alliance then you only need to learn three of the recipes listed up here right now obviously if you're going to be spreading your characters out across the different alliances you'll need to learn other groups of three recipes but the reward speaks for itself every time you complete a writ you'll be picking up a substantial amount of materials plus recipes every day one of the advantages of having characters spread across the different uh, alliances is you may find that you can't complete on one day with an Aldmeri Dominion character, but you may be able to tick all the boxes for your Ebonheart Pact character. That one's able to complete the writ, can hand it in, will get the rewards, and there's a chance at the recipe that you loot, because you'll always loot to the tier that you've crafted it, your writ for. Uh, it's going to be the one that's going to tick the box with that old Mary Dominion character. The more characters that you've got spread across different factions, the more writs you're going to complete, the more recipes you're going to get, and it's going to help you fill this list of boxes pretty quickly. The other option is you can go to the guild store and try and uh, to any guild store across Tamriel and try and buy them. Some places tend to do better than others when it comes to recipes. You shouldn't be paying more than 25 to 75 gold for a green recipe anywhere. So if you're looking at something that's 500 gold, remember where the vendor is just in case, but I'd look around. Even after you've maxed out your provisioning, food remains one of the most vital components to the leveling of your characters in the Elder Scrolls. And as you unlock blue and purple tiers uh, in your ability set, you'll find that when you complete your writs, there's a chance that you'll actually loot blue or purple recipes each day once those writs have been handed in. Now in regard to recipes, if you're going to be going out there and you're going to be buying these recipes rather than waiting for them to drop in your daily rewards, you really need to be running a, a, an add-on called Awesome Guild Store. It will let you filter down and search for recipes with a minimum of fuss and you won't have to keep typing those strings in every time you go to a new vendor. Uh, look, the, the most visually straining exercise I've done in this game is trying to shop for recipes. The default interface for guild stores in this game, uh, look, I, I have to say it, it's rubbish. It's absolute rubbish, especially if you're looking for one thing and a whole stack of things. It's looking for a needle in a, in a stack of needles. So get awesome guild stories. The link up here right now, I've got to a video of, of other add-ons too that you might also be interested in. Make your life a better place. If I want a baked potato recipe in Awesome Guild Store, I can just type in baked or a partial string, run a search, and it'll tell me if anything comes up into that category. In this um, particular um, store, nothing at the moment. What I can also do is just take the text filter out altogether and just run against unknown recipes at the moment. And this list comes up starting from 27 gold each. So I can go through and I can start accumulating just for the sake of being able to get recipes. They're going to help me produce. Look, if you've got the extra money in your pocket, do it. Go through and buy as many of these as you can. Um, you, for green recipes, you don't want over T4 if you can help. 
Halper. T5, T6, just not worth it. You're going to be at least on blue, but you should be on purple uh, recipes by then anyway. Um, but this will get you started, and this is starting to move us into a position where we can start thinking about maxing our provisioning. Now I'm from that generation that still understands pen and paper technology. So not what, not what I'd normally do at this point is I'd go through and I'd take an inventory of whatever resources I've got for provisioning in excess. So at the moment I've got 220 corn, that goes on the list. 224 fish, that goes on the list. A whole stack of flour, we're good for garlic, we're good for ginger. Uh, ginkgo, that's a good number that'll get me through. Same with ginseng. Anything from about 120 plus in quantity is going to be useful for us and when it comes to maxing out. We've got an enormous amount of honey and a lot of tea and a lot of um, alcoholic beverages require honey, plus uh, some food recipes too. So that's a good one to have. Isn't glass doesn't hurt to have as well. Uh, and once I've got this inventory of um, items together that I've got in large quantities, what I tend to do is go down to a guild store and I start buying recipes that are going to allow me to use uh, these materials um, to, in quantity. A, a single recipe at a particular tier, at a particular level that I can spam that's going to give me enormous gain when it comes to moving my provisioning forward. Now, like I mentioned before, you're looking for recipes generally around every fifth level. And in the higher ones, as long as the quantities are good, then every tenth level, because the experience gain is enormous. Um, and from there, we can start building up a profile and a path on how we're going to build. Now, once I've found those recipes that utilize those that don't cross over, you don't want two recipes that share the same resource because the, the first production uh, wave uh, production cycle using a material is going to deplete it significantly. Second time you come around, if you're depending on that to get you through a tier, there's not going to be much left. So what I'm doing is I'm basically building a path of recipes and components uh, every fifth level to kick off because your um, experience gains aren't so high. Um, until I get to about level 25 and 30 and then from there the whole path streamlines very very quickly. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with, let's have a look here, flank steak. I've got multi craft installed as well. If you saw the alchemy part of this video you'll know what that is. This will let me craft 79 so I can click that button and I'm running multiple monitors at the moment so I could just go to another monitor right now and watch an anime or do something else while I wait for that operation to complete. Now watch your, your level gains. I'm 50 at the moment so I'm not going to see anything. Once you hit the next tier, you want to stop this operation. Me, I just press escape and that cancels it. Then be going into your provisioning from the craft skills menu and then adding any relevant skills. Chef is a good skill to have, add that straight away. The big one's recipe improvement. This is the level of, of recipe. It's the one that's gonna allow you to craft up to a max level. And at the moment I can, uh, I can craft up to veteran 15. But um, you'll notice that you're, um, until you put a point in this, you'll cap out on tier one recipes. You may be able to learn the higher tier recipes, but you will not be able to use them until you add, add a point that unlocks that level for you. And again, too, uh, as you go, unlock the chef and brewer skills, toss points into those. And what will happen is every time you produce something, you'll get more in quantity, which means that once the operation's complete, walk straight over to a vendor somewhere in this tavern right now sell all that stuff off you're not going to consume it you're not going to use it however you will get a healthy amount of money back from selling them three four five six hundred depending on the tier of the recipe and the quality of it and all that stuff um, and you may even find that that just the money that you get back from handing uh, from selling that that stuff off will cover your costs this covers provisioning and alchemy if you've got any other tips that I haven't covered in this or any other techniques that have helped you max these skills out any faster than what I've shown, please, for the benefit of everybody else, add them to the comments down below. Any feedback that you've got, uh, any way that this has been useful for you, I love comments, so don't be shy adding those. If this guide has made your world a better place in any way and streamlined you when it comes to maxing out your provisioning and your alchemy, then don't be afraid to like this video. Please, by all means, subscribe too. Jura Rocky Mountain.
If I could turn back time and remap out how I was going to balance the trade skills of my character, I would have put Woodworking Enchanter onto the same character. At the moment I've got a Woodworker, Clothier and Blacksmith all on the same Dunma, and I've managed to get most of them close to max on around level 26, but when it comes to managing inventory space and other stuff like that, it would have been nice just to have another character that I could have moved that onto. My Enchanter is currently sitting on level 43, and when you have a look at the enchanting part of this video, you'll see why I haven't put a big drive into getting that character maxed out, because it's going to take a lot of money and a lot of work to do. You're going to find also, too, a lot of the woodworking information in this video mirrors what you've seen in the blacksmith and clothier video, if you've seen that already. If you haven't, still going to be useful stuff there for you. Go and have a look, and I've, I've short bullet pointed a lot of the things that I've covered in there. But if you want more of detailed information on how to really get the most out of your woodworking skill, I strongly recommend that you take a look at the blacksmith and clothier video that's also attached. Let's do this. For all intents and purposes, woodworking is almost identical to clothier and blacksmith. The workflow is exactly the same, you've got the same window. Like blacksmith, you've got a weapon and an armor option, although armor is only ever a shield. Uh, deconstruction, refining, improvement, research, all of that stuff, it's more or less identical. So there's a lot of, not a lot of new stuff there for you if you've already started working on those skills. If you've seen my other video on blacksmithing and clothier, then I'll have covered most of the key points required to level this. But look, I'm quickly going to go over them again, just in case you haven't. First and foremost, do a big harvest right at the beginning when you're preparing to go. Get as much T1 material as you possibly can. And I've gone over that extensively, but there's also a link coming up here as well that's going to show you, uh, or at least give you some tips and a heads up on how to go out there and do that. Also, stealing as well, although finding wooden items to steal doesn't tend to be as easy as armor. Uh, look for bowyers, um, and there are stores that sell um, bows and shields and things like that that tend to be mingled in with other weapons, or rather armor. So grab that stuff, break it down as well, and stockpile it in the bank. In terms of the sort of level skill you're looking at, uh, the level range you're looking at to max both of these skills out on the same character, you're going to be looking at around 51 to 56 points, skill points that you'll need to plow into it. Uh, now, if you're if you've built a, a strong character that can solo, that can go out and adventure, that's done a bunch of dungeons, does faction quests. Uh, if you're prepared to get off the beaten path and go to much higher levels and do sky shards, find as many of these as you can that aren't in delves. Um, and if you're adventuring and doing a whole bunch of quests, you should be able to bring those points in at around levels 23 to 26. I'm more than confident you could um, get a character around that level range that's able to, to max out both of these skills and specialize in enchanting and woodworking. A good thing about woodworking is almost everything that you build requires absolute minimal amount of materials. Your staves and your bow only take three wood if you're building a level one uh, bow or weapon, while your shield doubles, you're effectively using six. So you really want to be concentrating on building with these materials here right now. Like I said in the blacksmithing and clothier video, there's no point making a level 14 item. While you'll get a little more experience, you're going to consume substantially more materials. You're using three times the materials that you're using from um, producing a level one bow. You're not going to get three times the experience. I can almost promise you that. Deconstructing items made by another person is a good road to go down. You get more experience from deconstructing other people's work than you do for your own. One of the fortunate things about woodworking is the materials, the raws and the process materials tend to be cheaper, substantially cheaper than metals uh, or clothier materials. I guess because it's a, it's a it's much smaller range of what you can make at the end of the day. So don't be afraid to invest your own money into these materials. And again, too, it's very easy to do writs on all your characters by using stockpiled materials sitting in your bank. Um, the payment is obviously you've got a chance of getting the same legendary or, or very high level tempers. Plus, you're going to get payment for every one of those writs that you complete. You're looking at around an extra, I don't know, 2,000 gold a day just from doing woodworking writs on all eight of your characters. For more information on how to level woodworking, I really strongly recommend you have a look at the blacksmith and clothier video. I'm bringing a link up right now which will point you towards that. Um, and this will give you uh, probably just m more detailed information than what I've given you already, plus one or two little extras in there as well. Workflows are almost identical, so there's no point reinventing the wheel on this one.
of all the crafting skills, enchanting is the most problematic when it comes to maxing this skill out. But before I go into the details of how to get the most experience out of the process, let's just take a quick look at exactly how enchanting works. And this will help you understand the problems if you haven't figured them out already. Enchantment is an enhancement art. It centers around the creation of glyphs, small items which bind onto equipment such as your armor, your weapons, or your jewelry. And what these glyphs do is they will add additional properties onto these items, maximizing the potential of this equipment when it comes to such things as defensibility, resistance to the elements, or adding additional damage to items. Some people may have may already be using these. In almost every city you go into, you're going to find there's an enchanter store. You can go in there. You can buy glyphs and you can manually bind these. This whole side of the operation is pretty simple. However, all this equipment caps out at white quality. You're looking at the lowest quality potential glyphs that there are on the marketplace. Also, not all of the possible properties are represented when you go to the store. And this is where enchanting as a trade skill finds its niche. Essence runes introduce properties to glyphs. Magicka, stamina, health, also shock, fire poison armor all of these are added from essence runes and you can find these anywhere in tamriel you can find all of the ones that i've mentioned in a tier one zone you can find them in the end game areas where people adventure as well very very common easy to get and on the cheap side when it comes to buying them from the store Aspect runes control the quality of the glyph once it's been created. Tar, the most common, uh, the one that you'll find everywhere in this game, will produce a white glyph, which pretty much puts what you create on par with what you're going to buy in any store across Tamriel. But J Jota will kick it up a step and take it up to green quality. Denata for blue, Rekuta for purple, and finally Kuta for the, uh, for the yellow legendary glyphs that you see in the game as well. And this is for end game equipment. Now one thing, again, these aren't level specific. You've got as much chance of finding a Kuta glyph in, let's say, Dalmora or Stonefalls or Kanathi's Roost as you would in finding it in Craglawn or, or Cyrodiil or anywhere else in the game. And this, in a way, um, it keeps the, the quantity and the availability of these pretty high uh, and it puts a level of control over the price as well. Now, potency runes determine exactly how the properties of that essence rune are going to be expressed through the item that it's bound to. Uh, it will either ra uh, strengthen, raise, reduce, or increase resistance to whatever the property is coming through from that essence rune. Also, to the particular choice of potency rune that you use will also determine what the item is going to be bound to. Choosing one over another will immediately bind it to armor, to jewelry, or, or to a weapon. Your choice of potency rune also directly determines what level that glyph is going to be once it's created and this itself becomes the problem and the limiter when it comes to enchanting. Tier 1 potency stones can only be found in the tier 1 zone and in an ordered universe uh, every rune stone that you find has got a 1 in 3 chance of being potency so unless you're harvesting like a madman you're going out there and uh, you're trying to get as many of these things as you can your access to these is going to be pretty limited. Now, and what that also means is if you've got a character that's crafting at a much higher level than they're adventuring, then you will be dependent on other sources for getting potency rune stones that are going to help you get the most out of that process. Now, deconstruction is always an option, and the glyphs that you buy from the different stores across Tamriel can be deconstructed but you immediately run into the same problem again. The level of the glyph that you can purchase is directly linked to the level of the zone that the store is located in. So you may have been buying glyphs in uh, Stonefalls, for example, breaking them down to stockpile the potency runes that you need, but then as your skill advances, it pushes you to a point where you're out of the range of what you can buy in Stonefalls. You need to move to Mournhold into Shan in order to access the higher level glyphs. And for a while, as long as you're prepared to ride on your horse and get out there in the world and um, pursue uh, your craft, then you're not going to have any problems until you hit Craglawn. And Craglawn, unless you're of the correct character level and you've done the prequest, you cannot get there. Your access to these rune stones is immediately cut. And this highlights or demonstrates another reality about enchanting. You can't not spend money in order to move this skill along. The experience gains in enchanting if you're not using the highest level potency runestones that you can get 
is minimal. It's extremely low. It's a very, very painful skill to enchanting. And in order to be using the higher level rune stones, you're going to have to move way out of your comfort zone if you've got a low level crafter, or you're going to have to focus it on your main adventuring character themselves, which is in itself a valid strategy because there's a double incentive for you to harvest harder in the higher zones once you get out there. But you will spend money before you bring that in at level 50. You can do writs on your other characters. Now, you, you can't create glyphs and drop them in the bank and then use those straight away on other characters. But look, the recipes are pretty simple at the end of the day. You're going to eventually build up a very, very big stack of T1 property runes, uh, of T1 potency runes at the end of the day. Jorio, I've got 157 of them sitting here, and these are the ones most commonly used in the, the first tier writs. Um, now, when it comes to effect, it's either going to be stamina... Uh, health or magicka so we could drop all of our Denny, Mako and our um, Oko um, glyphs and uh, runes in the bank as well as well as all these tar ones as well and anybody could um, create glyphs out of those and that would immediately go towards completing their um their writs also by dropping them in the bank as well there's a secondary component to your writ is that you need to turn in a particular um rune stone with the writ as well and if you're following this method then these will already be sitting in the bank you'll be able to pick one of these up take it down hand it in your payment not nearly as much often as it's worth although this is one of the few uh, although again you can get legendary materials back legendary um rune stones from completing a writ the very first time i completed uh, an enchanting writ on a low level character i got a kuta um, rune stones straight away which is worth 6500 at today's prices so writs can be worth doing now when it comes to deconstruction enchanting follows the same rules as blacksmith clothier and woodworker you can you get more experience from deconstructing other people's work than you do from deconstructing your own how you can make this work for you is to rather than spending money on uh, on rune stones in the same tier as yourself and if you're in the mid range that's probably where they're at the most expensive there's less people in the mid range that are harvesting they tend to be focusing on getting up to the high end while in Cyrodiil and Craglawn people have more time to harvest uh, and the, the runes obviously are more common because there's more people in that level range uh, you may be better off picking up a whole bunch of potency runes at the very very top end of the game gather a bunch of tar or jjota rune stones that you've got in your stockpile and then grab a whole bunch of essence runes that you've got put them in an email uh, in the mail and then send them all off to to a maxed out enchanter in your guild ask them to make a whole bunch of glyphs for you mail them back and then progressively bust them all down for the experience boost now unlike um a blacksmith clothier and woodworker you can get materials back if you are breaking things down outside your level range the odds of success for enchanting seems to be low when it comes to returning materials however when you do return something you tend to get quite a lot uh, you don't always just get one thing from um, deconstructing something you get to however you will get substantial experience from breaking down those runes uh, those glyphs that have been created by other players for you and again you have a reasonable chance of getting a, a reasonable percentage of those materials back so you accumulate them save them up and again when you've got enough of them send them off to another person this is how i got the biggest spike uh, in experience points or in, in inspiration for enchanting it's gotten me over 25 to 20 to maybe even 30 levels um, in the game finally do your writs do them every day do your enchanting writs uh, the second that they become available it will remain the single most valuable uh, operation that you can perform towards the goal of completing and maxing out enchanting it will give you better return than anything else you could possibly do any one single operation as far as um, gaining inspiration and moving towards maxing this otherwise painful skill out and that concludes woodworking and enchanting look if you got anything of value out of this video please take a moment of your time just to click the button the like link underneath this video they all add up and it shows me that i'm actually giving something useful out to the rest of the community out there and it's much appreciated also look uh if you like what you're seeing then please by all means subscribe and that way I'll, it'll encourage me to to keep bringing you the best content that i can bring you 
uh, on a regular basis. Thank you for watching this video. Please take the time to watch more.